hello again. Well, we're entering into chapter five of our book about the grizzly attack of 1967. Um, as you remember, um, lots of exciting things have been happening and stories about animals that have been attacking people. Um, but right now, and at the end of chapter four, a grizzly was had just broken through the window in the old cabin owned by Pa, and Kevin and Mel is, are with him. So let's see what's gonna happen. Chapter five. Mel leaped away as the claw claws whooshed through the air, missing Kevin's cheek by inches. A shard of glass shot into Mel's arm, but she barely noticed the pain. Her eyes were glued to the grizzly's paw. The bear was reaching through the hole in the door, swiping at the air with its pointed white claws. Each claw was at least three inches long. Mel tried not to think of what those claws could do to her flesh or to Kevin's. As if it wasn't horrifying enough, the grizzly thrust its head through the window. Kevin shrieked and Mel stumbled back. The bear started bashing its paws against the old rattled door. Its dripping wet jaws snapped open and closed. A cloud of the bear's steaming breath rushed up, up Mel's nose. She gagged. It smelled like rotten meat and vomit. Pops grabbed hold of Mel's arm and pulled her back. Go away, he shouted at the grizzly. Mel had never heard her grandfather scream so loudly and somehow it worked. The bear pulled its head out of the door. There was a moment of silence. Then bam, the entire cabin shook as the bear threw his body against the door. Bam, bam, bam. The wood of the door groaned and cracked. Bam. A lamp crashed on the floor. Bam. A framed picture of little boy Pops fell on the ground. Crash. Between each slam, there was a skin crawling, scratching noise like giant fingernails cutting across the chalkboard. The sound of the bear's claws digged into, digging into the wood. Kevin was whimpering in fear, building, burying his head in Mel's neck. She held him tight. What would happen if the grizzly got inside the cabin? Mel looked frantically around their small room, searching for something she could use to fight back, but it was hopeless. Even if they had a loaded rifle within reach, there was no guarantee bullets would stop gri this grizzly in time. If that grizzly got in here, they were all doomed. Suddenly, Pa snatched up their dinner bell from the table. It was big and made of brass. He shook it hard right in front of the broken window. Clang, clang, clang. The sound was deafening. Kevin put his hands over his ears. They stood there for one second two seconds, five seconds, waiting for another bam at the door, but the sound never came. Mel held her breath. Pop stood frozen, still holding the bell high in the air. A minute passed. Finally, Pops lowered the bell and let out a big breath. He peered through the broken window. It's gone, he said. Mel stepped up and looked outside. Pops was right. The bear was nowhere in sight, but its deathly stink still hung in the air. That was a short chapter. Now we're on to chapter six. What do we do now? Mel asked Pops. He was cleaning the cut on her arm. A shard of glass was, had left her with a nasty oozing gash. We need to tell the rangers, he said. The station is closed now, but I'll call first thing in the morning. What will they do? They'll have to trap the bear, he said, tearing open a Band-Aid and carefully pressing it over Mel's cut. They'll move it up the mountains, way into the wilderness. He ex explained that the rangers had a special kind of trailer that trapped problem bears. They'd hitch it to a Jeep and drive it to where the bear was last seen. They bait the trap with deer or elk meat. The bear would climb inside and get the bait and slam. The door would shut behind it, locking it in. Then the rangers would drive the trailer up into the wilds of the park, far from the campgrounds and hiking trails. They'd release the bear and they'd drive away. What if the grizzly comes back here, Mel asked. It won't, said Pops. But his eyes flickered and Mel could see he wasn't so sure. Mel wanted to help Pops clean up the broken glass, but Kevin needed her. The little guy was all shaken up. Mel found him on her tiny cot, tears pouring down his face. I'm sorry, Mel. I made the bear mad. 
Oh, Kev, Mel said, lying down next to him and pulling him close. It's not your fault. She tried to make her voice sound calm, like moms did when they were upset. You didn't do anything wrong. Shh, shh. After a few minutes, Kevin's sobs slowed down and Mel pulled the blanket over them. She thought about all the times mom's calm words made things better. There was the time they saw bats in the outhouse and the time they discovered a huge raccoon standing on the counter in the cabinet cabin. It had looked at them and hissed. Well, good morning to you too, mom had said to the raccoon. She always made them feel lucky when they saw something wild. To her, a shiny green beetle was more beautiful than a diamond ring. Every spider web was a work of art, but mom wouldn't have felt lucky tonight. The bear had terrified all of them, even pops. In fact, Mel was secretly glad that Kevin wanted to sleep with her. She snuggled up close to him. A few minutes later, he drifted off to sleep with both arms right, wrapped tightly around Mel's neck. Mel could hear pops moving around the cabin. He'd already hammered a piece of wood over the broken glass in the door. Now he was sweeping up the glass. She closed her eyes and tried to fall asleep, but the Derek attack kept playing over and over and over again in her head, like a slideshow that wouldn't stop. It just didn't make sense. Grizzly didn't act this way or smell that way. At least no grizzly she ever heard of. She'd only seen a grizzly one other time in her life. As Kevin breathed softly next to her, she thought back to that unforgettable day. Now that's the end of chapter six and technically two chapters is about all we have time for. But I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more. How's that? Because this is getting interesting. Chapter seven. It was two summers ago when she saw the grizzly. She and mom were hiking together on one of their favorite tra trails. It was just the two of them. Dad had stayed in the cabin to watch Kevin and Pop's knee had been giving him trouble. Mel was always happy to have mom to herself. They were walking along a babbling stream when suddenly mom gasped. Mel followed her worried gaze across the water. There under a tree was a large bear laying on its side. It looked like it was sleeping. Even from 10 feet away, you could tell it was a grizzly. It had a hump between its shoulders. That was the main difference between grizzly bears and black bears. It was important to know the difference because grizzly are more aggressive and powerful than black bears. Grizzly's attacks are very rare. They usually only happen when a grizzly was surprised or felt threatened. And this bear would be very surprised and would feel very threatened if he woke up and saw Mel and Mom standing there. How had this bear not heard them coming? Mom and Mel always made noise when they were hiking. That was rule number one in grizzly country, to make noise so you never surprise a bear. They talked loudly, they sang, they clapped. Mom and Mel were the loudest hikers in Glacier. Why hadn't this grizzly woken up? And then they figured it out. Mel, Mom said, grabbing Mel's arm, the bear is dead. And that's when Mel noticed the bear's eyes. They were wide open, staring, unblinking. They stood there for a moment. Come, Mom said, let's go see. They crossed the creek and knelt down next to the bear. Mel's body jangled with a mix of fear and excitement. This was a once in a lifetime chance to see Glacier's most fearsome creature right up close. It was enormous with shaggy brown fur dusted with gray. Mel studied the bear's rounded ears, its shiny black nose and giant snout. Mom pointed out all the budges on the bulges on the side of the jaw. Those were the muscles that gave Grizzly such a powerful bite strong enough to chomp through metal. What a magnificent creature, Mom said. She spoke very softly, as if it were an, in, they were in an art museum or a church. It's very old, Mom said. You can tell by its teeth. The bear's mouth was open just wide enough to see inside. Its teeth were worn down and chipped. Three of its four long teeth and the canines were gone altogether. Mel gently put his hand on the bear's side. They disappeared up to her wrists in its glossy fur. But what amazed Mel most about the grizzly and gave her goosebumps were the bear's claws. They were enormous, practically like baseball mitts, furry on top with thick black pads on the bottom. She knew how powerful they could be. One smack could walk, wipe out a moose. And those claws, long and white and slightly curved, Mel touched the tip of one, with one of her fingers. 
it felt strong as steel. Mom and Matt, Mel sat with the bear for a long time until the sun started to drop down in the sky. Then they gathered as many fallen pine branches as they could. They placed them carefully over the grizzly's body. They said a little prayer and they left the bear in, the wild, in its wild resting place. We'll never forget this, Mom had said. Mom was right. Mel could still remember every detail of that day. That grizzly didn't seem like a ferocious beast. It was beautiful, like one of glaciers, lakes, or waterfalls. Nothing like that monster they'd seen tonight. End of chapter seven. See you tomorrow. Bye.